What's up, Chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. Well, some people have been asking for an update on the drug vertiporfin for hair loss. I did a video on vertiporfin a year ago, and if you want to see some of the more preliminary research on that drug, then I'll link that video below. But just a review, vertiporfin is a drug that actually is FDA approved for treating macular degeneration in the eyes. So it's not like some of the new treatments I've presented before, which will have to undergo vigorous FDA evaluation, as well as multiple clinical trials and involving hundreds of patients before it can even be released. Vertiporfin can be used off-label right now for hair, and in fact, some people are already using it, as we'll see shortly. Now, when it is used in the eyes for macular degeneration, vertiporfin is injected intravenously and then activated by laser light in the eyes. This actually causes destruction of abnormal blood vessels that grow in the eyes of people with macular degeneration, which ends up improving their vision. So at first, this doesn't sound like something that would be good for treating hair loss, right? Well, Vertiporfin has another very interesting effect, and that's its effect on wound healing. Normally, in human beings, the end result of wound healing is scar tissue. Scar tissue is dense, stiff, ugly, connective tissue containing lots of collagen. Scar tissue, unfortunately, is not normal skin. It doesn't have a good blood supply, and most importantly, it doesn't have any hair follicles. This is important for people with androgenic alopecia who need a hair transplant because it means that there are a limited number of grafts that can be harvested from the donor region of the scalp. After grafts are removed, scar tissue forms, and the hair follicles don't grow back. It is possible to harvest hair from regions outside of the scalp, like beard and body hair, but these options are not considered ideal and don't give the same cosmetic results even when they are performed by a skilled doctor. As it turns out though, wound healing doesn't have to involve growing scar tissue at all. Animals like starfish, salamanders, and Namekians can lose a whole limb and just have it grow back completely normally. That never happens to human amputees. When they lose a limb, it is permanent. The wound healing mechanism of humans developed pretty late in the evolution of life and it prioritizes the speed of healing over regaining functionality. Wound healing through fibrosis and the development of scar tissue is much faster than regrowing normal skin, so this probably had a survival advantage for mammals who were constantly getting wounded in their battle for survival. Anyways, very rarely, regrowth of healthy tissue instead of fibrosis does happen, as seen in this widely circulated image of an old man with androgenic alopecia who had a scalp burn and regrew his hair. And I know this case report has been hyped up ad nauseum by a certain somebody, but the truth is that even though this case study is very interesting, it is still an anomaly. You know it has to be pretty rare when pretty much the only picture of this phenomenon available is a black and white photo that looks like it was taken by a camera in the 1950s, even though it was from the 1980s. The fact is, though, that in the overwhelming majority of people who suffer from third-degree burns, they'll be left with nothing but scar tissue. I could post some pictures to demonstrate this fact, but that would be extremely distasteful, and I think you chooms already get the picture. So, scientists are very interested in the molecular mechanisms behind fibrosis, because if they could learn the secrets behind this process, it might be possible for humans to regrow limbs or paraplegics to heal their spinal cords and lots of other potential uses that could benefit humanity. One of these uses might be in regrowing hair in the donor site after a hair transplant or even reversing the fibrosis that occurs with androgenic alopecia that results in a slick, bald, slaphead look. Well, I won't repeat all the technical details of my last video on vertiporfin, but to summarize it, what has been discovered is that the key to scarring is that a gene called engrailed 1 is activated in fibroblast after an injury. Fibroblasts are the cells that actually create the scar tissue of a wound. Vertiporfin inhibits a protein called YES-associated protein, or YAP, also known as just YAP. The YAP protein prevents these fibroblasts from activating the engrailed 1 gene. As you can see in this figure here, there are two alternative pathways of healing. One pathway seen at the top, which is activated by YAP and engrailed 1, leads to dense fibrosis and lack of hair follicles. This pathway, though, is blocked by vertiporfin, which instead leads to the alternative pathway at the bottom of this figure, which results in the regeneration of normal skin along with normal hair follicles. So pretty cool, right? This means we could have unlimited donor hair, so even a Norwood 7 could theoretically become a Norwood 1 again with enough surgery. 
The one problem with all of this though is that all the research done on this in the past was done on just mice and like I emphasized in my last video on stem cells, there are major differences in the skin and hair follicles of mice versus men. So what new information do we have on vertiporfin over the last year? Well, first we have this study here that appeared shortly after my last video titled, quote, Targeted inhibition of YAPTAZ alters the biological behaviors of keloid fibroblasts, unquote. Like I said before, YAP is the yes-associated protein, and TAZ-TAZ is a protein called tafazin, and both of these proteins are involved in forming scar tissue, and both are inhibited by vertiporfin. This study involved what are called keloid scars, which are thick, ugly scars that some people get after an injury. In this study, human fibroblasts from keloid scars were cultured, and the effect of vertiporfin was assessed. Anyway, this study found that YAP and TAZ are both activated more in keloid scars than they are in normal scar tissue. In this figure here, normal scar tissue is the black bars and keloid scar tissue is the gray bars. In this figure, adding vertiporfin to both the normal fibroblast and the keloid fibroblast increased what's called apoptosis, which means it basically killed those cells off. So this study again shows that vertiporfin can reduce scar tissue, this time in human fibroblasts, but it is still an in vitro study and wasn't done in intact human beings. There is a more recent study, though, that has been the subject of attention from the hair loss community. It is this one right here, which looked at the effects of vertiporfin in cute, adorable pigs called red duroc pigs. Now, Pigs are very useful for dermatology research because they have skin that is more similar to humans than mice, so this is a step forward. Also, don't worry, the pigs here weren't killed. They only got minor incisions for the research. Anyways, small wounds were made in these pigs and then sewn shut. The wounds were injected with either vertiporfin or a placebo injection, so we know good controls were put in place for this particular study. This picture here shows the healing process over time in the control wounds on the top row of pictures and the vertiporfin treated wounds on the bottom row. The results show that scarring was significantly reduced in the pigs that got vertiporfin and that the vertiporfin wounds had full regeneration of the hair follicles while the control wounds did not. Also, the vertiporfin wounds were more elastic and had greater tensile strength than the control wounds. In other words, vertiporfin caused wounds to heal with skin properties much more like normal skin than scar tissue. Unfortunately, this study has not been formally published published online, at least as far as I can tell. I'm not sure where the images of this study came from. Maybe it was a poster presentation somewhere, but anyways, I've not been able to track it down. But in any case, the study was well conducted and the results are very impressive, so I don't think it matters much. Finally, we have a gentleman named Dr. Bargoofy who has been treating a patient with vertiporfin and the results are being published on the site Follicle Thought, which I'll link below. There are some images on that site like this one here, which shows some hair emerging from the surgical scar site, which is not the case in the control patient. Of course, this is just one patient we're talking about here, so I don't want to jump to any conclusions, but this is the start of some human research, which even though it is just a case study, it is still a very important step forward in the research on vertiporfin. Clearly, the next step beyond this would be a randomized controlled study that included a large group of people divided into a treatment versus a control group, and that could help us determine once and for all how effective vertiporfin is. But so far, my outlook on this treatment is very positive and I'm encouraged by all of these recent developments. So I'd keep my eye out for this one. It definitely deserves more attention than a Redditor trying to scam people out of $70,000 so he can fund a bogus topical broccoli juice solution for hair loss, but I'm kind of beating a dead horse now at this point. So I'll go ahead and keep an eye on this research and if I see anything new, I'll make sure you guys are posted about it as soon as possible. So until then, thank you for watching, Chooms. God bless.